Um, that being said, to me, one of the ones where I was most sure and had my mind changed the most quickly <clears throat> was we're doing a myth called killer cable snap, which is if you're on a boat and uh, the boat gets under tension and one of the cables snaps, that that cable can whip around and slice right through you like a ghost ship. Um, it's something that every fisherman in the world knows to be true. And you talk to anybody on any coast who works in boats, and they'll say, absolutely, I know that it's happened. There's a lot of cases of it happening. And our researchers did have a bunch of cases of people who'd been sliced in half by cables. Um, so we set, up, uh, we set up a rig for testing different thicknesses of cable, stretching them to their, to their breaking point with hydraulic rams, and then cut, we'd stretch them to 90% of their breaking strength and then would cut them. And we figured out a way to drag them around a bollard so that they'd whip when they got cut. And we put a bunch of uh, whole pigs in front. And we really, I swear, we were like totally looking forward to the high speed shot of the cable slicing right through the pig like a samurai sword. And at 11 a.m., we'd done four separate hits and all we had were a bunch of dented pigs. It hadn't even broken the skin. No matter whether we use a quarter inch cable or three sixteenths or half inch. And I was looking at this and I thought either we're getting this totally wrong or the date or the, our research is slightly off. So I called our head researcher, Linda Wolkovich, and I said, you know, do we have any confirmed cited cases of people, firsthand accounts of people watching a cable slice through somebody? And we had none. We didn't have a single one. We had all these secondhand accounts. A doctor treated a guy whose legs were lost. Now, there's a lot of ways that cables can cut you in half. A cable can get pulled against a wheelhouse or some part of the boat. That absolutely could cut you in half. Uh, on an aircraft carrier, the cables that catch the planes, uh, if you're in the way of one of them as it's moving, it can cut you in half. But that's not a whipping cable. That is a cable that's like this thick around. It's like being hit by a steel beam. It's not the spirit of the myth, which is that it can whip and slice you. And so by the end of the day, we busted that myth. We, uh, and I'll stand behind those results absolutely. Uh, I don't think that it's physically possible for a whipping cable to slice somebody. I was totally convinced the other way when we started that shoot. Number seven. By the way, KOP as a username, as I'm wondering if that's a Crazy Cat reference, which is one of the greatest comic strips ever written. I wonder if it's Officer Cop. Or is COP K-O-P-P? -P? Or is that the California State Senator? <laughs> OK, number seven. Since you have perfectly formulated, since you have perfectly formulated given surname of Savage, have you ever considered that you are destined to be a vigilante superhero crime fighter? S2, 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 S2. I think I got that right. Um, Crime fighter. <laughs> are, uh, are you thinking of Doc Savage, the man of bronze, high atop his secret lair in the Empire State Building? Um, yeah, no. I, I tell you, I am actually fascinated by the job of policemen or, or, or law enforcement. And it's very specifically for the same reasons that um, I'm good at being a mythbuster and that I was a model maker is I love seeing things behind the scenes. I think on a, in a theater, if you've ever worked in theater, backstage, much better show than up in the, in the house. Um, I love seeing how things work. And so to me, police and law enforcement, it's, I probably couldn't stomach it, first of all, but from a, the, the, the fantasy in my brain, it's absolutely looking at everything from the other side, behind the line that you normally don't get to see. That fascinates me. Um, but I probably wouldn't be cut out for it because I'm kind of non-confrontational, actually. Um, that being said, uh, uh, Penn Gillette has already named his daughter Moxie Crime Fighter. Crime Fighter is her middle name. All right. Number eight. What kind of exposure did you have to science as a kid? Cleland. Uh, my important, important teachers in grade school and high school were science teachers, actually. Dan Frere was my freshman high school earth science teacher. And I remember hanging out with him on many lunches and after school, uh, talking about things that I didn't quite understand that he said, or elaborating on ideas, or just sitting and talking. Um, it was so long ago, he smoked in the classroom when we were talking. That's how long ago it was. Um, and I remember very specifically that those discussions fomenting real involvement in me um, with the material that I was learning in class for the first time. Um, it was science teachers and art teachers. 
Uh, Mr. Benton in high school art was super important, gave me a tremendous amount of latitude to try everything that they had in the art room, and I did. And then uh, in, in junior year or senior year in high school, I think I took chemistry with uh, Nicholas Dimitrius Zimopoulos. And I absolutely failed chemistry. I passed only because of how much I spent after school talking to him about physics. Uh, I found physics far more interesting. I probably should have taken it. I was absolute shit at chemistry. But again, it was the involvement, uh, those three teachers, of specifically their involvement with me. And actually, uh, there was uh, Mrs. Gortzema in senior English. It was the teacher being interested in what I was thinking about, as well as me in, engaging with them about the material. And honestly, uh, when I've taught, teaching is something that I definitely want to do when I'm done doing Mythbusters. I taught for a couple of years at the Academy of Art College in their uh, industrial design department. And... Uh, the, that engaging with, this, with the students, watching them get what you're saying is absolutely thrilling. It's terrific. By the way, the ejection seat that I'm sitting in is my own. This is one of the things I, I, I you know, I come up with something that I've always wanted and I put it in the set. Is that more comfortable than a desk chair? Uh, it's actually got the, it's got everything but the rockets. I've even got a survival kit in the seat. Well, no, there's a, there's a website. There's a web, yeah. <laughs> Actually, this, this is, a I think, a DC-10 pilot's chair, and I pulled that out of the plane it came from out in the Mojave Airport during the very first time we did explosive decompression. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, nine, number nine. I recently saw a video here on Reddit where you were discussing obsession, talking about objects you had made, like the dodo skeleton and the Maltese falcon. I also remember from one of the moon landing myth episodes that you had a replica spacesuit that you had modified to be more authentic and made yourself the red striped mission commander. As a person who understood your talk about obsession and the quest for the object being so rewarding, I was wondering what are some of the other objects you hold dear to your heart and what was the farthest you've gone to get information about them? Anything you're currently working on or researching in your time off that is interesting? Yes, yes and yes. Um, Probably the farthest I've gone to get information, well, that's hard to say because honestly, if I have any time to myself, I am, well, like I said in the talk, I'm just constantly downloading information uh, into, into my to-be-sorted folder, and then I find myself with an extra few hours on an airplane, and I start sorting everything, and if there's something I need augmentation on... Um, I am not above calling the art director from the film, the prop master, uh, calling friends in the industry, making introductions, going to the companies that made things, talking to them about their design process, um, buying all the books on the subject. I did, uh, way back when, about seven years ago, I made uh, the Henry Jones diary from, from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, I went so far as to figure out exactly how many signatures there were in the signatures or the packets of pages that make up a hand-bound book. Um, I printed up all the pages, had them repeat on the same periodicity that the actual film accurate one did, the same number of pages. I hand sewed them all together. I made all the covers. I made a run of 10 of them because if you're going to make one, it's only slightly harder to make 10. Um, and ended up selling them and trading them to friends for other, for other movie props. And that one was actually pretty crazy obsessive. I mean, you're talking uh, 102 separate pages, each one with art on it, some of them hand-painted, plus something like 35 separate inserts, each one on different kinds of paper, each one weathered to be precisely looking like it's sat in a book in someone's pocket for a bunch of years. Um, 